Thank you and well, welcome everybody to day two of our virtual conference on aging, COVID and health technology. We're delighted to have you here for us or with us for this uh, second day. Our focus today is going to be on innovative models of care and technology for older adults. And we're fortunate to have as our opening keynote address uh, in the William Forbes lecture, uh, Professor Neil Charnas from Florida State University, who will be doing uh, this year's uh, Forbes lecture keynote. Uh, if you're not familiar, uh, Bill Forbes was the founding director of the program in gerontology at the University of Waterloo. He was also the founding president of the Canadian Association on Gerontology, the Ontario Gerontology Association, and a founding vice president of the Gerontological Society of, of America. So Waterloo has always played a substantial role in aging in Canada. And Neil was one of the founding members of our program in gerontology who really put us on the map. Um, Neil and Bill worked together with other colleagues like Barry McPherson, Peter Nose, Jack Carlson, Jim Frank, Jennifer Jackson, and later Mike Stones to establish Waterloo as a leading organization in gerontology in, in our country. Uh, Neil is a uh, William Chase Professor of Psychology and now the Director of the Institute for Successful Longevity at Florida State University. He got his BA from McGill University and MSc and PhD from Carnegie Mellon in psychology. He's, um, he was an assistant professor at Wilfrid Laurier before coming to Waterloo from 1977 to 1994. After that, he moved to Florida State University. Uh, Neil's research focuses on human factors approaches to aging and technology use. He has over 200 journal articles, book chapters, and proceeding papers published. Uh, and he's been a co-author of books such as Designing Telehealth for an Aging Population, A Human Factors Perspective, Designing for Older Adults, Principles and Creative Human Factors Approaches, uh, as well as a second uh, paper on Designing for Older Adults with Case Studies, Methods and Tools. Neil's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the Association for Psychological Society, Science and the Gerontological Society of America. He's received a number of different awards like the Jack A. Kraft Innovator Award, the Franklin Taylor Award, the Powell Lawton Award. That award is named after one of the founders of gerontology internationally. He received the APA Prize for Interdisciplinary Team Research. He's a Grand Master of the International Society for Geron Technology, and he's on the APA's Committee on Aging for, he received that award for Advancement of Psychology and Aging. So a highly uh, accomplished and uh, successful leader in gerontology who uh, played a key role in launching the University of Waterloo's efforts in, in this regard. Uh, Neil and I worked together when I was a brand new assistant professor in the program of gerontology. And I could say one of the things that um, distinguishes him in my life is Neil introduced me to the internet, if you will. Uh, uh, this was 1993. I came into my office and Neil was sitting in, in his office watching his computer and I said, what is that? What are you looking at? And he was looking at something called a mosaic internet browser and he was watching a solar eclipse on the internet rather than going outside and watching the solar eclipse. So, Neil, you're the one who introduced me to the world of, of web browsers. I, I don't know if that's a life-changing uh, event for me, but you're the one who, who set that mark for me. So we're absolutely thrilled that you could come back and join us uh, again to share your your research and experience and knowledge about technology and aging. And it's wonderful that you can be here in this commemorative uh, lecture uh, for Bill Forbes as well. So take it away, Neil. Thank you so much for that uh, very kind introduction. Let's just make sure whether my screen is being shared. Is it being shared, John? Looks good. Okay. All right. So my title for today is the promise and limits of technology for promoting successful longevity. And um, I'll just advance to the next slide, I hope. Uh, before I get started, I do want to just say a couple of words about my relationship with Bill Forbes because Bill and I became colleagues within a few years of my joining uh, UW in 1977. And like many in my generation, I wandered in the aging area by accident. And Bill was really instrumental in introducing me to people in Canada 
through the Canadian Association on Gerontology, uh, which he'd helped to found, the Ontario Gerontological Association. And I participated with him in expanding our then new interdisciplinary gerontology program at UW. And I can never pay Bill back for all the guidance and advice he provided to me as a then young faculty member. Uh, what I try to do is pay it forward by helping other young scientists expand their contacts, uh, particularly through the institute that I now direct. So with that, I'd like to just give you a kind of a quick overview of what it is that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, one of them is the two revolutions. I'll talk a little bit about older adults and technology use. I'll talk a little bit about um, why I think there's low adoption on the part of aging adults. And then I'm going to introduce a framework and end by talking a little bit about the limits of technology and uh, draw a conclusion or two. So let's get started. Um, way back when, when I was an associate dean for computing in the Faculty of Arts at UW, there was a project um, to digitalize the Oxford English Dictionary. And hence, for my definition of technology, I'm going to go to the OED because it has a Waterloo tie-in and um, use one of their definitions, high technology, which is really referring to either a firm or industry that produces or utilizes highly advanced and specialized technology or to the products of such a firm. Um, a more pragmatic definition is simply an adaptive device. So today that means anything with a microprocessor and or a radio in it, kind of like the example here of uh, the um, watch and the smartphone that I'm showing. So I've often asked what I mean by the term successful longevity. And really, I think it's when someone across their lifespan can set, pursue, and hopefully achieve their goals. If they can do that, then they can be said to have experienced successful longevity. That's to contrast it with successful aging, for those familiar with the row and con definition. And the reason I've changed it is that some people, some very famous people, well known by the Perimeter Institute here at UW, um, have been able to set, pursue, and achieve their goals despite not necessarily having the best of health. Stephen Hawking is, of course, the person I was referring to. I want to get to the two revolutions. Uh, I made an argument back in 2004 in the preface to a book on Gero technology, although that phrase is now Geron technology, that there are really two important revolutions. The widespread population aging, which we can see on the right. These are raw data from World Health Organization, looking at world life expectancy from about 1950 to about 2020. And what you can see is a huge, huge increase. It's about 25 years from about 47 to about 72 over that uh, roughly 70 year period. So that's what we call the longevity dividend. The fact that children born today can expect to live in the world about 25 years longer than they could have only 70 years ago. Sorry, jumped ahead here, one too many. The second revolution is what I call accelerated diffusion of technology. And the table you can see over here on the left is one that uh, we generated in a handbook chapter uh, quite a few years ago, back in 2005, where we looked at some modern technologies, specifically, not that modern, the fax machine patented in 1843 by Alexander Bain. Um, it took till about 1990, I estimated, about 150 years before there was about 50% adoption. If we contrast with the, that with the telephone invented about 30 years later by Alexander Graham Bell, another Canadian tie-in here, he was a Scot as well, 1920 was about the point at which there was 50% adoption in U.S. homes, 44 years. If we look at the microprocessor invented by Intel in 1971, 
till it got to about half of households was about 2001, 30 years. The internet, which I take as starting with TCP IP network in 1983, took only 18 years. And what you can see is this speed up that's taking place in the, in the rapid diffusion of technology. When you put these two together, both uh, in this case, the aging revolution and the technology diffusion revolution, unfortunately, we see that older adults are still lagging. And I'll show you some US data. These are data from the Pew Internet and American Life surveys, two separate ones. Uh, the one on the left is data from 2019. And what it shows, that is, it goes up to 2019, they started doing these surveys back in 2000. And you can see this huge lag back in 2000 between older adults who basically were only at about 12% internet use. That is, they responded to a survey item saying, um, I've used the internet in the past year, about 12%. Whereas 18 to 29 year olds at that particular point in time were at over 70% using the internet. Today, the two youngest cohorts are at a, basically 100%. The 50 to 64 group is not quite there yet, maybe at about 90% as of 2019. I suspect with COVID, they got there, a uh, good chance in 2020. Um, but you still see a lag, about 72. In other words, about a quarter of older adults, age 65 plus in the US, are still not on the internet. You can see a similar situation with respect to smartphone ownership on the right. Uh, virtually 100% of young adults own cell phones, but 96% of the 18 to 29 year olds own a smartphone. It drops to 92% to 79%. And it's only, this was in 2019, only about half of adults age 65 plus own smartphones. They own cell phones, about 92% of them own cell phones, but only half of them own smartphones. So th this is the technology lag, the age digital divide that I'm referring to. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and now talk about a framework I, I think is helpful. I published it back in uh, 2020, um, talking about praise. That's a framework I, suggested is useful when considering ways to carry out interventions with aging adults to improve, in this case, their person environment fit. Uh, the first is, of course, to prevent impairments. So we want people to reach old age in the best possible shape. The second is in case you don't reach old age in the best possible shape, if you develop impairments, is to try to rehabilitate you, get you back to where you were. Take the example of someone who has a stroke. They have problems with moving their limb and possibly with rehabilitation, with exercises, we can improve their ability to carry out reach operations, maybe even totally restore their ability. That would be the next preferred um, when prevention doesn't work. However, for everybody, they're not all going to be able to um, rehabilitate to get back to earlier function. In that case, we look at augmenting their failing capability. It's very common in old age, particularly for men, to develop serious hearing impairments. In that case, we can provide you with a hearing aid. Now, if you lose all the hair cells in your cochlea, so the hearing aid boosting sound isn't going to help, then we might be able to substitute for or replace a failed function. Things like a cochlear implant, which can bypass the cochlea send stimulation directly on the nerve that carries uh, auditory information back to the brain. I'm gonna talk about that now in the context of some, some issues, broad issues. The first is brain training. And um, this is an attempt to rehabilitate declining cognitive function by getting you to carry out exercises, usually computer-based. And there's an enormous controversy over the effectiveness or efficacy of that intervention. In 2014, two groups of scientists published open letters. One was a group headed by Stanford and the Max Planck Institute in Berlin with 70 plus scientists who made the claim that brain games do not provide a scientifically grounded way 
to improve cognitive function or stave off, in this case, cognitive decline. And then within months, 133 scientists and practitioners countered that, in their view, the literature demonstrated benefit of brain training for a wide variety of cognitive and everyday functions. And so a group of people, and what was really interesting about that second statement is some of the scientists who signed the first statement also signed the second one. So that tells you the degree of controversy there. Um, a group of us who had signed neither statement got together to do a very extensive review specifically of the studies that were cited by companies who um, basically uh, sell brain training programs to the public to assess the claims. And this was headed by Dan Simons at University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. And uh, what we showed was, actually there is extensive evidence that brain training interventions improve your performance on the specific trained tasks. Much less evidence that such interventions improve performance on closely related tasks and very little, or at least at that time, no real evidence that training enhances your performance on distantly related tasks, or that it would improve your everyday cognitive function. So rehabilitation doesn't seem to work for improving cognition in aging, at least in terms of helping you with everyday cognition. What does work? Well, if someone asked me, I'd say your best bet is aerobic exercise. Um, there are a series of studies that try to summarize other studies. They're called meta-analyses. And what they show is there, there's an effect of about a quarter of standard deviation of improvement. Now, this is for sedentary older adults. But that's still a, a far distance from the roughly one and a half to two standard deviation cross-sectional decline that you see in so-called fluid cognitive abilities. So I think we may need to look at augmenting or substituting because it doesn't look like rehabilitation is going to get you to uh, high levels of functioning. And where might high levels of functioning be important? Driving. Um, one of the systems, or in brand new cars today, there's a lot of what we call ADAS, Advanced Driver Assistance Systems. These are systems that, for instance, provide you with information about uh, whether traffic might be entering uh, in front of you from the side, uh, whether you're about to crash into a stopped uh, barrier in front of you, it might be a car that stopped suddenly. That will indicate whether there's a car in your blind spot so that you don't change lanes uh, wrongly. And it's been recommended as being particularly helpful for older drivers, in part because older drivers run into issues with hazard per perception or hazard detection, this ability to anticipate when some situation in the roadway might demand uh, some rapid action on your part. So forward collision warning, lane departure warning, these are all important systems built into a lot of new vehicles. Uh, there are a number of issues with them, but the main one is, do they really help? So I wanna talk very briefly about a study one of my doctoral students conducted, um, who's uh, now at Clemson University, Dustin Souders where we looked at in simulators whether older adults benefited, uh, particularly for critical events with forward collision warning and lane departure warning. Those were the two systems we looked at in our study. And what you can see here on the right is a change between having no system present, the leftmost dot, and having a system present, the rightmost dot, under the critical event situation. That is, Drivers who had forward collision warning gave much more headway, it's technically called time to collision in seconds, for that critical event than people who didn't have that in their uh, simulated vehicle. There was no such uh, impact when the events didn't call for, um, in this case, uh, providing adequate headway. Let me summarize. There were a lot of different conditions we looked at here. Lane departure warning did not appear to help, at least in the simulator. Forward collision warning did. And in fact, the thing we were concerned about having all these potential alerts, the combination of the two did not show increased subjective workload using um, an instrument called the NASA TLX, 
relative to other groups that didn't have those systems. The other interesting finding is that acceptance attitudes for this technology were quite high. Older adults were quite willing to adopt ADAS, and we showed in, in uh, a prior study, uh, particularly blind spot detection was something they were willing to spend a lot more money on than were, for instance, younger uh, drivers. Okay, so I wanna talk about using augmentation now for another problem. Loneliness and social isolation. Um, these are conditions, they're a little bit different. I don't have the time to get into the distinctions today, but there have been a number of epidemiological studies that show that loneliness and social isolation increase your risk for mortality and morbidity. Basically, they're equivalent to smoking. And so they're a, a serious public health problem. And uh, so serious that the uh, UK appointed a special minister for loneliness back in uh, 2018. The question we had is, can technology help, particularly now that um, everyone is suffering from social isolation because of COVID? So this was a clinical trial carried out by the Center for Research and Education on aging and technology enhancement, uh, colleagues that I have now at Weill Cornell Medicine and UIUC. The aims of this particular 12 month trial were to examine the usefulness and usability of the PRISM system. You can see a screenshot on the right and to look at its impact on things like social isolation and social support, well being, and also uh, how it affected their attitudes and their proficiency in technology acceptance. And uh, we had two groups. We had a PRISM group and a control group, which had a binder with similar information, uh, of, you know, classroom lessons and calendars and photos and uh, games that you could physically play, that type of thing. And we looked at the impact of this particular system. These were older adults who had never used computer systems. And at six months, we got fairly good support for the use of this system. Social support uh, was increased, loneliness decreased. This is relative to the control condition. Emotional well-being was up, social isolation trended down, uh, but computer comfort, interest, efficacy, and proficiency all went up in the uh, experimental group. We reported on this in uh, the uh, gerontologist in 2017. Sadly, um, these effects didn't persist beyond six months. At the 12 month period, the two groups were closing uh, again on things like loneliness and social support as well. No longer a statistically significant effect. The trend was there, but no longer significant. Um, so we had some transient effects. We had enduring computer proficiency effects. Even a 96 year old in our sample was able to learn to use the system because it was extremely carefully designed according to good human factors, iterative design principles. And um, we're now trying PRISM2. And uh, PRISM2 is uh, now based on a tablet system. We're just analyzing the data now for six months. But the question is, are those types of tools effective or could they be effective when we get into these every century uh, situations? So I'm gonna talk now about a little project we did. This is not a scientific project with SARS-CoV-2. Um, when that hit in Tallahassee, our senior center be became closed immediately. And my institute had to go completely virtual. But one of the things we worried about was social isolation and loneliness for seniors whose main outlet was the Tallahassee Senior Center. Could we help? And we thought, yes, we probably could. One of the things I started doing, these are my parents in a Zoom session there at the time, they were 95 and 97, they live in Toronto. And uh, I figured if they could learn to use Zoom, all seniors could learn to use Zoom. And so what did we do? These, uh, my assistant, Callie Kindlesberger and halftime media person, Bill Edmonds and I set out to do iterative design of step-by-step -step senior friendly instructions for Zoom. There's a link if you want to uh, provide them to other seniors. It's on our ISO website. And um, we knew that just giving people the information wasn't enough. So we made use of our community linkages with the Faculty and Friends Club of FSU. They're mainly retired faculty, hence they're much more tech savvy than the average senior in our senior center. 
And so we used iterative design to build up that instruction set, refined it based on their feedback, and had them agree to be mentors to seniors in our community. We had a newspaper story run about this particular initiative, and Hans Meyer, who was our guru on Zoom, he was the one training the sysadmins to train the faculty who suddenly had to teach their courses using Zoom at FSU during the pandemic. He also agreed to help out. And so we learned a few lessons on this process. First is, of course, Zoom has great videos on their website, but they're tough to use if you're trying to do step by step procedures. So carefully designed step by step uh, instructions can help novice seniors to get on to Zoom. We coordinated with our senior center uh, and provided them with mentors to help other seniors. So we think that technologies that promote social participation can be helpful. I don't think they can substitute for human contact, but I think once every hundred years or so, at least, at least, I hope that's when we will see our next pandemic. Um, they can be very useful, that sort of technology. So I'm going to try to wrap up a little bit by talking about substitution back in the um, area of transportation and talk a little bit about autonomous vehicles. What you can see is a Google self-driving car. These things are now deployed under ideal conditions in Arizona, even without a backup driver in them today. Uh, but that's an area with sun, clear pavement markings, very low traffic. I have to admit that manufacturers have been predicting the deployment of uh, autonomous vehicles for at least the last eight to 10 years, that it's going to be in the next few years. I'm hoping uh, in my lifetime we'll see that. It turns out it's a very difficult problem. But really there's a preliminary question we need to understand. Are older drivers ready to trust, ready to accept that form of transport? We ran a survey for the Florida Department of Transportation some years back. This was a, a project where we had a representative sample of older Floridians looking at their attitudes towards AV, but also to ADAS. I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the concerns that were expressed. So I want you to pay attention to just the blue and red parts of these particular um, pie charts, because they represent people being very concerned or somewhat concerned, slightly concerned in this case. And you can see that there was significant concern on the part of um, older Floridians about whether these vehicles would interact safely with pedestrians and bicyclists, um, whether there'd be equipment or system failure. Those of you familiar with Windows and the blue screen of death, we didn't want not a virtual blue screen of death, but an actual blue screen of death. They were concerned with legal liability, with sharing the road with humans, and whether that technology would be even as good as better human drivers. So I think current attitudes are not that favorable. I have a student who's doing her master's thesis defense tomorrow, talking about a more recent survey using those same questions. I think it will get um, a good reception from those particular older adults who no longer drive because the benefits may well outweigh the costs. But as I mentioned earlier, we'll need to see smartphone use rise in order that they can summit that uh, technology and use it. Okay, I wanna end by talking a little bit about some of the limits and constraints on technology adoption by older adults, and in part why we see a lag in the uptake. The first is um, a more technical question. How reliable is a, an integrated system for of humans together with technology? And I'm gonna, I've shown you some data on the left um, from a study we did with heart failure patients and a non-heart failure um, older adult control group, where we were looking at a, a, a mesh network we set up in their homes, along with then cutting edge or bleeding edge, I should say, uh, home-based healthcare system. And for things like how long the network was up, this was a study run in DC, in the Tallahassee area. Uh, it was up a pretty good percentage of the time, but it wasn't perfect. We have thunderstorms in uh, Tallahassee, and that results in power failures. And we found out some of the systems didn't reset properly, had to go back to the manufacturers and so on. But the thing I want you to pay attention to are the bottom three rows. The percent of time that people took their blood pressure, the percent of time they took their daily weight, the percent of time they took a daily survey, just a few questions 
on a device. This was before tablets. Um, and what you can see is that the human part of the human system uh, grouping was not all that reliable. In fact, in this case, heart failure patients who already were very hard pressed to go about their daily activities were the ones significantly less likely to take that daily survey. On the right is a survey. This was again from Pew. So it's a representative sample of Americans. And what it looked at was a particular question. When I get a new electronic device, I usually need someone else to set it up or show me how to use it. And what I've got plotted here are people who either strongly agreed or agreed to that particular statement. They need help to set it up. And you can see there's a huge change from the 18 to 29 year olds where perhaps only one in five need help setting up a new electronic device to three quarters of people age 65 plus. That's an indictment of the design community in terms of the types of devices and particularly the type of training that is or isn't in many cases available to them to help them. And that I think is partly one of the reasons we see this age aging digital divide. So let me draw a few quick conclusions and save just a few minutes for questions. I think the two revolutions I mentioned, population aging and speeded technology diffusion are very likely to be continuing, I suspect for at least the next 50 years or so. I think technology products and systems hold considerable promise for both rehabilitating, augmenting, and in some cases, even substituting for age-related negative changes that I've talked about. There are positive changes too, but for the most part, negative. I think, however, there are some serious limits for technology adoption that probably produce the aging digital divide. The first, I think, is the usability of the systems that we turn out, particularly in terms of people's satisfaction with them. And I wanna add another feature that we don't often think about, maintenance of these systems. That's, I think, something that's uh, not very, pay is not paid attention to, particularly by the human factors community at, at large. The second is, of course, the reliability of that integrated human system interaction. And that's something we need to work on too. I haven't got time today. Maybe there'll be a question about it. Adherence, long-term adherence to these systems is another area that we uh, do research on in, in my lab. Um, and that's something else that's a limit. Uh, what I've shown you on the right is a little bit of my family tree. These are again, my parents. Uh, my mother just turned 96. Uh, my father, with a little luck, he finally got his uh, first inoculation shot, as did my mother in Toronto, um, is going to turn 98 in May. And next to them are their great-grandchildren up in the tree, the family tree. There are my grandchildren, Benjamin and Madeline. Benjamin will be returning for his second year to McMaster. And uh, Madeline next year should be a senior in high school. And my hope is that we're gonna design better products for them uh, so that hopefully they don't fall behind as uh, they get to the same age that my parents are at. Thank you for listening. And uh, I think we might have a little bit of time for questions. Great, uh, thank you very much, Janiel, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Lots of uh, very interesting um, uh, content there and uh, uh, very thought provoking in terms of what we may or may not be able to expect with respect to uh, technology and, and aging. And, and congratulations on that robust uh, family tree of yours. Uh, uh, a couple of healthy looking parents at that age. I, I do hope that you'll tell Madeline about the University of Waterloo as one of the places for her to think about going when she's finished high school. Um, I, I, I think she might be interested, we'll see. Okay, that sounds great. So Neil, I've got a, a couple of questions uh, for you. One is a, a good one to put you on the spot and then another one, maybe I'll stir up some controversy. Uh, sure. A, a follow up uh, to it. So uh, with the Neil Charnas crystal ball, what would you say within the next five years and then within the next 10 years are the two most promising technologies for each of those timeframes that you think will be available to help seniors? 
Um, I, I think probably um, easier to use interfaces and except for the maintenance side of it, I'd say things like smart home speakers. They're increasingly being used now, mainly in pilot types of projects with older adults. That's uh, things like Alexa or um, you know Google Assistant, smart home speakers. The reason is that you can use they, they use a natural language interface speech. Now, that doesn't work very well for people with accents, is what I've seen, and it doesn't even work very well for me. Sometimes, unless you allow the system to store a lot of speech samples, but then, as we know, the companies tend to abuse their privileges in terms of privacy and confidentiality, turn on your speakers when they shouldn't, or turn on the video when they shouldn't to help build up their uh, AI systems. I, I think, I think, sorry, that's the 30, 30 minute mark here on, on my timer. Um, I think that those are probably promising interfaces that are easier to use. Though, again, they have some restrictions to them. They don't work very well when it's noisy. Or as a good example, when my microwave is running, I, I, the instructions to turn on and turn off lights in my house doesn't work because that interferes with my Wi-Fi network. Um, so there, there are there are drawbacks to those systems, but I think speech-enabled interfaces are, I think, are, are very promising. Okay, and well, there is a, there is a good Saturday Night Live skit on Alexa. Oh, wonderful Alexa. one on now, Silver Alexa. Yes. Yes, that's Alexa. right. Um, so on my list would have been for the five-year window, probably less than five-year window, would have been e-bikes uh, in the sense that I think they'll, for people that want to be active, will keep some people cycling longer. It may actually open some opportunities for, for some older adults. So that's a near-term technology that I think may be interesting to watch. Yeah, um, Xer Gaming is, is uh, something that, yes, has been used. Um, mixed results so far on the, on the few studies I've read. Okay, so then the the here's the one to maybe uh, get you into controversial territory. Um, this is a, a type of technology that I have not been enamored with whatsoever, um, but folks have promoted in the long term care setting. That is um, the social robot. So you know the 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 baby seal um, was you know designed to keep uh, seniors uh, happy and and not lonely. I did not see a profuse diffusion of baby seals to solve the loneliness problems of seniors in long-term care during COVID. So I wonder about your thoughts about um, the the social technology that you use compared to use of robotics as, as a source of socialization. Yeah, we, we have a situation where we had the robotic pets. I'm part of a coalition. Uh, there's a, a coalition on aging in Tallahassee. And a lot of the um, nursing homes and assisted living facilities have representatives. We meet once a month now by Zoom. It used to be at the senior center, and um, they they were uh, constantly advertising that the uh, state had picked up a lot of these pets, and was willing to hand them out, and there wasn't a lot of take up, is the impression I guess I had. Um, Actually, one of the CREATE members has done a little research on that. They are engaging for seniors, but we want to distinguish between augmenting social support and substituting for social support. And I think they can augment, but I definitely think it would be a mistake to use them to substitute. Because I think human contact, I mean, they're, they're, they're minimally responsive in, in interesting ways. They're getting smarter, but they're still incredibly dumb. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's it's a bit of a mixed bag. I think it might help some people, uh, but you know, the research has been not very good, and they haven't had very good control conditions. Uh, for instance, to compare it with equivalent time with a human, as an example. Right. Right. Yeah. And and so, what's your sense about the the prism technology? Was there more that you could have done to make the the success of that longer lasting? What what would you do next in in terms of that? Yeah. Technology? So we redesigned it and tried to put in a lot more uh, social connectivity options. One of the things people asked for was video conferencing. When we um, looked at the end of the study as to what other things people wanted to have in that type of system, and so in the current system we built that in. Um, I could talk about this for like a whole hour here about all the lessons we've learned so far. We're just analyzing, as I said, the six month data and it only extended to nine months in this particular study. So uh, we'll only have those those two data points. I don't know how well it worked, so I, I can't tell you, but uh, okay. we should have the data in uh, in the next couple of months. 
Okay, well, thank you for that, uh, those answers and for that wonderful presentation. It was uh, very enjoyable and uh, I see we're at the, uh, the, the time mark where we'll pass it over to Dr. Catherine Burns for the next session. Thanks again, Neil. That was great. Thanks so much. I appreciated the opportunity. Great. Thank you, Neil. And thank you, John. And don't go too far away, Neil, because we're going to bring you back. Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm very honored to um, moderate the next part of our program. Um, during this part, we're going to have two um, additional speakers join you and with questions in between. And we're going to have a discussion with the two speakers and Neil in, uh, in a general panel okay at the end so i'm going to run through the logistics here so um brett we'll be starting you at about 145 you'll get 15 minutes then we'll have five minutes for questions and answers then nova will switch to you again 15 minutes five minutes for questions and answer in each case i'll pop up my camera just about two or three minutes before the end as a little bit of a timer for you uh, just so that we stay on track 225 i hope to bring all three of you together and we'll discuss um questions from the audience uh, that we have and the few questions that were sent in earlier. So we can have a big and fulsome discussion um, on this topic. So please audience, think about your questions and get ready for the, the broader discussion at the end. I'm going to move ahead and introduce our two speakers for this afternoon. So our first speaker is Brad Belchutz. He is the co-founder and CEO of Maple. Uh, Maple is uh, Canada's leading virtual care provider and connects both patients um, and healthcare providers like doctors and therapists for online medical visits. Uh, he's also a practicing physician in Toronto and senior fellow at the Fraser Institute. Um, most recently, I saw it just when I was checking things up this morning was that Maple's provided free online screening and consultation for COVID-19. So we appreciate you helping us all out <laughs> on our pandemic this year. Um, you know, so we'll welcome Brett, and then I won't have time to do introductions in between, so I'm also going to introduce Nova right now, too. So um, Nova Syed's been working at the intersection of policy, technology, and industry for over a decade. She's currently a team lead at the Ontario Ministry of Health Pandemic Response and Recovery Division. Her systems design lens is informed by shepherding a portfolio of innovative health technologies from evidence development to adoption, as well as leading health infrastructure policy at the Office of the Treasury Board. Um, Nova was an MBA fellow at the University of Toronto's Creative Destruction Lab and holds a Bachelor of Science in Molecular Genetics. Um, so a warm welcome to both of you, Brad and Nova, and I think we'll ask you to take it away, Brad, you're first on our agenda. Wonderful. Well, well, thank you very much for having me. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, first order of business, I have some slides, so I will bump those up on the screen, and hopefully they're showing up to everybody now. If if they're not showing up, then just let me know, and I will uh, I'll do my best to get some technical support. So, without further ado, um, I have a short period of time just to talk a, a little bit about how uh, Canadians uh, who are aging have been dealing with their healthcare and how technology has allowed them to obtain better access to healthcare and specifically how we as a company, Maple, our virtual uh, care platform has been instrumental in providing better access to healthcare for aging Canadians. So uh, I'll, I'll jump in just into the slides here. And so first thing I just wanted to speak about a, a, a little bit, and, and this probably is something that won't be terribly surprising, but before we get into healthcare, I want to speak just a little bit about how older Canadians are actually using technology in general, because it, it is a real contrast to what we see in healthcare. So if you look at the stats, uh, this is really interesting. So there was a recent study that was commissioned that looked at how Canadians who are 65 plus uh, were using tech, different forms of technology during the pandemic. And so what we saw is is actually quite interesting, quite revealing. So, so first of all, we see that a very significant majority of older Canadians have a smartphone. So about two thirds of Canadians are using a modern uh, mobile device to actually communicate with others and to meet many of their daily needs. And so uh, digging into that further, when we actually look at the, the usage patterns of those smartphones, what we see is an even bigger majority of those people that have a smartphone are actually using it. So over 80% are using it at least daily. So we know these aren't just devices that have been you know, purchased for them by family, by friends that they're that are sitting in a closet and, and not really getting real use. These are a day to day support for older Canadians. And 
this is something in our world in Maple, uh, this is something that we've seen uh, day in and day out. We've seen older Canadians absolutely be very, very comfortable in general with technology. Uh, you know, if you look at the average person who is 70 years old right now, understanding that it's 2021, this is a person who was 50 years old in the year 2000 and technology, uh, including mobile phones and the internet was ubiquitous uh, 20 years ago. So it, most of our elderly population are actually uh, adults who were in their prime adult years when many of the technologies that we look at on a day-to-day -day basis came into widespread use. Um, the other stats here that I think are interesting is that a pretty good percentage uh, of the elderly Canadians that were surveyed are doing video calls on their smartphone. Uh, a huge percentage, 72%, are very comfortable using this technology. So we're, we're not really seeing the huge age gap, which is often spoken about. And I think this is one of the big misconceptions that you see in the media that uh, bringing technology into the ways that services are accessed uh, creates a big gap for those who are older. In fact, what we see is that those who are older often are extreme adopters of technology. And in fact, in many cases where physical barriers are great for the access to services. So especially when we think of during the pandemic where uh, elderly uh, Canadians may not want to be physically going to a doctor's office or to a bank, et cetera, um, having access to be able to do these things remotely is actually a very, very powerful tool for them to continue to engage in many activities of life when potentially being physically isolated or immobile. So jumping in from there, um, you know, the big question is what about healthcare? And, and so, you know, again, we've, we've throughout our experience been, uh, we've received a lot of pushback. Uh, a lot of people have come to us and said, you, you know, having a means of accessing healthcare that is based on technology uh, may cut off those people who are older because those people who are older may not know how to use it or may not have any experience using it. So what we've seen is we've seen prior to the pandemic, we saw a very, very slow adoption of technology in healthcare. So if you look at pictures of all of the typical environments where people deal with service providers, so you know, dealing with banking, travel, et cetera, all of these things have moved into the digital realm almost in their entirety. But in healthcare prior to the pandemic, if you looked at a picture of the medical experience, it was almost completely unchanged from something you would have seen 50 years ago. It was something where everything was in person and everything required a waiting room. So we haven't changed it very much. So, you know, I, I always like to, to sort of put up a use case of the way healthcare was and, and really point out some of the, the difficulties and pain points in the experience. So what you have here is, is a very typical experience uh, for healthcare, even up to the pandemic. You know, Maple's been offering virtual care for almost six years now, but even leading into the pandemic, only a small proportion of people in Canada knew that they could see doctors online. So this story is a very typical one, you know, an elderly patient, and I'm an emergency room doctor by background, and I saw this happen time and time again. Patients who have fairly minor primary care symptoms, like a urinary tract infection, something that they've had many times, and unfortunately, one of the biggest problems in Canada is lack of access to primary care. Patients wait days to get appointments. So this story is very typical where this patient uh, tried to get an appointment with their family doctor, and unfortunately, they were not able to get that appointment. And so as a last resort, because there was nowhere else to go in their neighborhood for evening-based care, they went to the local hospital, waited four hours in the emergency room, which is very typical wait time for basic issues in the emergency room. And at the end of the night, uh, exhausted, she got to the pharmacy and had her prescription filled. And this story doesn't even bring into to account many of the other pain points that I saw in the hospital where uh, people would slip and fall in the emergency room. They would be exposed to the flu in the emergency room or they would catch other infectious diseases in the emergency room. It's definitely not a healthy experience and this certainly wasn't optimal. So this is what we were seeing uh, even a year and a half ago before the pandemic began. So this aligns with um, some of the stats that, we, that I always see on a day-to-day -day basis and what I've seen working in healthcare for many years and a lot of what led us to actually starting a technology-based platform to ease access to healthcare. So if you look at studies of developed world economies, um, Canada actually has the longest wait times uh, for access of all forms of care of any country in the developed world. And so when we look at the stats, uh, less than half of Canadians are able to get access to their family doctor within 48 hours, even when they have symptoms. And if you extend that out, there's a full one third of Canadians that can't get access to a primary care appointment, even within seven days of being sick. So we know that that's not good enough. Uh, and so what we do know is that even elderly Canadians are being, we're being forced to go to very uncomfortable lengths, such as what we spoke about before to get access to care. And this aligns with the statistic on the right, where we see two thirds of Canadians have said that they needed to go to an emergency room if they ever needed to get care on evenings or on the weekend, which again, is not good for those Canadians, especially not good for elderly Canadians and not good for our system as a whole, because the price to our country of an emergency room visit is 10 times the price of a primary
One of the things we learned in COVID was yeah, that we had a lot of Wi-Fi problems. So here comes Brett. Brett, you disconnected for a minute or so there if you wanted to step back. Uh, lost him again. Let's just give Brett another minute to reconnect. Thanks, everyone. And I think I may be back. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back, Brett. Yeah. Uh, my my apologies. I've I've been having some strange network difficulties today. So uh, if I if I get cut off again, my apologies. Uh, can you still see the presentation? It looks great. Yeah. Great. Okay. So so anyways, just uh, you know, when we look at the stats for for uh, physician use uh, for physician uh, capacity, what we see is only about forty percent of Canada's. Doctors are working full year, full time. So uh, we see this tremendous opportunity to actually take advantage of all of the excess capacity of Canada's doctors to actually help meet that need. And at the same time, the other side of the opportunity uh, really showed in that even before the pandemic, a huge percentage of Canada's population was very interested in accessing virtual care. So two out of three Canadians said that they would be willing to use a virtual care solution either for themselves or for a loved one. So you know, one of the things I'll always talk about here is in this stat where we talked about only two of five of Canada's physicians were working full year full time. I was living and breathing that as well. So as an emergency room doctor, I was working full time. And at the time, that full time shift complement for an emergency room doctor was 16 shifts a month. And if I wanted to work at all uh, more than that, there was no way within the system for me to actually provide any more hours other than going and adding another hospital and trying to pick up full extra shifts somewhere else, which is something that I didn't want to do. There was no way for me to see more patients um, other than committing to huge extra amounts of workload and, and actually working 30 days a month, which I didn't want to do. So I typically ended up having about 15 days off every single month where I was completely unavailable to the healthcare system. So we really wanted to create a system that could take advantage of that kind of capacity and allow doctors like myself to provide more care. So that led us to, uh, and I'm going to jump into this, sorry, uh, that led us to starting our company, but I, I do want to comment on just the complexity of, of the healthcare needs of, of elderly Canadians. So, you know, we see a huge proportion of cancer cases occurring among those aged 50 and over. A very significant percentage of seniors uh, will experience depression. Three out of four seniors having one or more report having one or more chronic conditions. So this is the part of the population that really, really needs access to care. And so having that difficulty with care is incredibly damaging to this particular population. So when we think about older Canadians, even when we think about uh, around diagnoses such as cancer, one of the most important elements to actually getting a good outcome with cancer is early diagnosis, catching it before it progresses. And so when it's very difficult to get access to appointments, this is when we tend to see the outcomes get worse. And you know, same thing with things like depression and chronic disease as well. If you don't have easy and regular access to healthcare appointments, we typically see worse outcomes for all of these kinds of conditions. So uh, this is what led us to starting our company. And I'll just really quickly just tell you what we do. So we started our company uh, back in 2015 and, and built out an online physician network that works across the country. It's the largest non-governmental network of physicians uh, in Canada, and it's available in all provinces and territories. Our platform operates on a 24 seven basis and built into the platform is uh, the ability to directly connect to an on-demand general practitioner. And, and on the slide, it says under five minutes. Our, our actual wait time is typically about 1.45 minutes the last time I checked. So it's almost instantaneous connection to a general practitioner for care. And, and built into the platform is a full range of all of the things that you would look for in a physical doctor's office visit minus the actual physical touch. So the ability for the doctor to provide diagnosis, digital prescriptions, sick notes, laboratory requisitions, specialist referrals, et cetera. We also have a number of specialist care areas built right into the platform. So we started to expand this from general care. So we have things like endocrinologists, psychiatrists, et cetera. Uh, the whole platform works on your smartphone. So on your Apple device, your Android device, it can also be operated from any computer. And uh, one of the things that we're really proud of is just how strong the reviews have been. So we have over 150,000 reviews from our patients uh, that have been five-star reviews. And it really just speaks to the ease of use of the platform and the seamlessness of the experience and how easy it is to use. Um, this is just a very quick picture of what the experience looks like. And, and one of the things that we've really tried to do is make this something that's 
very, very, very simple to use so that even the most technologically challenged people can actually use this application with ease. And what we found is that we have patients that are well into their 90s that are using our application. Essentially, if you can operate a smartphone, you can actually operate our application, which is what we wanted to get to, because if you recall those stats of the percentage of the older population that have smartphones, these are the people that we want to be able to provide care to, and we didn't want any barriers beyond having a smartphone. Um, so moving forward from there, so just some of the things that we've been doing to support older, older adults. So I'll just jump through these statistics really quickly. I, I think what's really interesting to look at is that of our user base, and, and we've got a user base that's um, somewhere uh, approaching about 2 million patients that have access to the platform. What we see is that 10% of our users are 65 plus. And what's interesting is in the general population, 15.6% of P Canadians are actually 65 plus. So what we're actually seeing is that our user base actually very closely approximates the distribution of age of the general population, which means that we're getting very significant usage of the platform uh, from older Canadians. Because one of the things that we hear again all the time is that you know older people are not going to use the service. And in fact, we're seeing them using the service in a very proportionate amount to their share of the population, which has been very rewarding to see. Um, we also see that the majority of our, our patients that are older are looking to speak to general practitioners. So they're going for the primary care service and there's a whole range of symptoms. And these are just some of them, but those are some of the things that we've seen the, the patients coming in for. So really we have provided a very comprehensive set of symptoms and conditions that we're, we've been able to care for. And uh, the other thing as well is just that, that just of note here, just in terms of some of the use cases that prescription renewal or urinary tract infection case, what we find is 30% of our older users are coming in because they specifically have a prescription that they know that they want and they're looking to get a refill or, or a prescription for that medication. So uh, I'll just mention this really quickly because I think I'm quite tight on time, but we've done a, a really interesting project as well. So outside of what we do directly to consumers out in the community, we actually help to staff long-term care facilities. And this has been phenomenal. We've actually put our virtual care platform into long-term care homes in Ontario in a partnership with Trillium Health Partners and Ontario Health, because one of the biggest challenges in long-term care was actually getting physicians into long-term care homes, and specifically getting specialists into long-term care homes. So we, through this partnership, have allowed the entire physician team at Trillium Health Partners to actually provide ongoing care to long-term care homes in the Ontario region. And so we've seen hundreds of consultations with specialists from Trillium Health Partners. We've seen lots of prevention of emergency room visits, and this is now across six long-term care homes. And the idea now is that this will eventually expand beyond the six that we've started with as this pilot has been very successful. And the idea would be that this is going to spread to long-term care homes eventually across the province. And really the goal here is to make long-term care a place where high quality specialist care is just as accessible as it is out in any other part of the community. So uh, I'll jump into this. This is just the, the final slide here. I know that I, we're very close to running out of time, but in terms of what's coming next, so you know we've seen this incredible increase in adoption of virtual care as a result of the pandemic. Uh, we've seen really good adoption of virtual care in our experience amongst older Canadians. Uh, the things that I think are going to come up in the future is we're going to see more funding from both public and private sector for virtual care. So this is going to be something that's going to become more accessible across the country. I think we're going to see more integration between in-person and virtual care. Right now they exist in silos, but I think we're going to see more and more of the ability to you for you to actually see the doctor you see in person also in the virtual world and for records to be shared between those two use cases. And then the final thing, and this is one of the biggest goals here, is we're looking to see more virtual care programming that allows seniors to stay at home longer. So that whole program that I spoke about, that long-term care program that we're operating with Trillium Health Partners, one of the really interesting use cases that we're looking at is can we expand a program like that to actually have, help seniors in the home? So that seniors in the home have ongoing access to nursing care and physician care and specialist care and dietitian care and all these other things with home care workers supporting in the home so that we can actually keep seniors healthy in the home for much longer and we don't actually have to transfer many patients to long-term care home just to get access to those services. So I think I'm out of time. So I'll stop right there. Thank you so much again for, for listening in and for having me. I'll stop uh, sharing right now. Okay, great. Thanks, Brett. Um, we've got some questions from the audience. Uh, if we've got a few minutes with you. Um, the first one is, what do you think are some of the key strategies when transitioning the older population online? I think you had a lot of data saying that they're actually pretty successful about it. Um, but I guess, how do we take it a step further? How do we get that last 15% or that little gap? Yeah, it, it's a great question. I think in order to come up with strategies for, for dealing with that 15%, we need to understand what are the root causes 
for those 15% of people to not be online already. And, you know, one of the arguments, as I said, that we often hear is that they're not online because they're older. And the truth is that that's not the case. You know, even, even an 80 year old right now is somebody who is, you know, 50 in the year, in, in the year 1990. So again, technology was ubiquitous in, in these people's lives. So, so typically that's not the reason. So we, we need to unpack the reasons. Is it financial? Um, can they not afford an online connection? Is it uh, a mobility issue or a, a capability issue? So do they, are they impaired in terms of their eyesight or their use of their hands? Are these the things that are stopping them? Um, is it a language barrier? A lot of the time what we see is that people who are newcomers to Canada may not be able to communicate, uh, and so they may just need help with that. And then finally, is it as a result of illness? So do they have uh, dementia or a stroke or something else? So the solution for each of these is going to be different. So I don't think there is a one size fits all solution. I think what we need is a combination of economic supports for those people who are economically challenged. Uh, we need assistive devices for those people who are cognitively able to access virtual care, but may not actually be able to do it because of vision or mobility issues. We may need translators, or we may just need people in the home like, who can help those people who have problems like dementia or strokes. So I, I think we need to break it down, but I, I do believe all of these solutions are vastly less expensive than having these patients get all of their care in the hospital or in a long-term care facility. Absolutely. Yeah. And it really comes about knowing who those people are, right? And what's the kind of personal um, on-ramps they need to get onto that technology or to access it in other ways. Um, next question I have is a bit, um, is connected to that, is how do you see the role of caregivers in some of these technologies? It's a, it's a great question. Um, I think Caregivers are an instrumental part of a good outcome for seniors, especially as they start to struggle with complex illness or advancing age or, or issues such as dementia in the home. And, and we have lots of examples where we have worked with caregivers in the home to enhance access to virtual care. And typically, the way that caregivers uh, assist is either through the provision of technology or through the assistance of the actual uh, assessment or care of the patient. So we have, as you've, as we've noted, there's 15% of the population or so that, that we just can't access because they don't have smartphone technology. So a caregiver could be the person that just brings the smartphone or the technology into the home. The other part, again, is, is when we have a, a elderly patient who's un, who is incapable potentially of communicating effectively during a virtual exam, uh, they're incapable of actually cooperating properly with a virtual exam, or sometimes when we're doing a virtual exam, exam we just need an extra set of hands. So, uh, you know, as an example, as a physician, when I want to examine your belly, I need to have a third party do that abdominal exam for me, and I'll walk you through how to do it, and I'll watch the outcome on video. So, so there, all of these things, I think, are huge part of the role of caregivers. And then the other part of caregivers is really just making sure that follow-up happens. So we want to make sure if we have a visit with virtual care, and the caregiver there, let's make sure that the caregiver is aware of when the next visit is supposed to happen and that they're there to make sure that it happens, that they're there to make sure the medications are picked up and taken. So all of these things are really integral because, again, if you just get that visit into the home, but none of those follow-up elements happen, the visit isn't effective, the prescription isn't picked up, again, you've wasted resources and you don't have the outcome you're looking for. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think we really saw that even with the COVID vaccination bookings, right, how people would step in and sign up their relatives and even the libraries, I think we're helping people get online. Um, I have an audience question, um, kind of on the business model, actually, and asking if it's possible to have a single Maple account um, for use in a condo, apartment, or long-term care facility. So I think it's maybe a scaling up kind of question, right? I wonder if you could add some thoughts yeah, on that. So, so, yeah, so I, I'm not sure if somebody said, th is thinking in terms of a condo apartment, like for a whole building, and we, we absolutely do arrangements like that where we'll have like a group okay. sale where, where we'll, we'll provide access to large groups. So we do this for for large facilities. We do this for employers, insurers. We, we absolutely could do it for a condominium or, or, or apartment type building. Um, for a long-term care home, we typically will contract directly with the long-term care home for programs. So th there's lots of ways that we do this. Um, really, the sky is the limit, and our goal is really to try to figure out a way to get as much care as possible to as many people, and we can be quite creative about the models. Yeah, that's good. I think you've got a customer coming online there. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think one last question is that, is there data publicly available on the impact of Maple or virtual care um, in general with the older population? There's more and more. I think it, there was a scarcity of data in the early days when virtual care was just a very, very small minority of care. As we've seen the explosion of virtual care, there was one stat uh, from the pandemic, I think it was Kai High that, that published this, where 
The stats show that 70% of all physician visits in Canada were conducted virtually in the month of April 2020, which is just phenomenal. So as we start to see big data sources like that, there's a lot more sub data that's available about who are the groups that are accessing virtual care? What has been the, act, the, the outcome for them? Were they satisfied? Did it solve their issues? Did it save them time, et cetera? So absolutely, there is publicly available data and there's more and more of it every day. Perfect. Great. Well, I really want to thank you very much, Brett, for joining us. Um, please don't go too far away because we want to bring you back for the group discussion at the end of this. Um, at this point, I'd like to um, turn the floor, I guess, the virtual floor over to Nova uh, and invite you to begin your presentation. Thank you for joining us today, Nova. Great. Thank you for having me. I think one of our IT wizards will help me navigate the slide. So thank you for that. Um, today, I'll speak about my experience in managing a portfolio of health technologies in the province of Ontario from evidence development through to implementation. So I'll start out if we can go to the next slide uh, with a few points on the landscape in Ontario and then touch on my observations in, on the levers for adoption, as well as some lessons learned and success factors. So we've got for in health innovation, there are different types of health innovation, right? There's technology, which can be new drugs or medical devices. It might be a new clinical procedure as well as diagnostic tests. There's also process innovation, changes to staffing uh, techniques um, uh, around resourcing uh, new equipments or models of care. And then on the right hand side, we've also got infrastructure that could be procurement and delivery of major capital projects, large hospital projects, INIT infrastructure or supply chain. Uh, for today's conversation, I'll focus on the technology side. Next slide, please. Right. So innovations generally tend to follow a common pathway from initial development to adoption and procurement in Ontario. However, there isn't a one size fits all model at all. Some technologies can be quickly adopted by healthcare providers, whereas others might actually require the Ministry of Health or other ministries to adjust their programs, funding, or policies in order to enable uptake. A new technology or process is developed by innovators. So we've got a process flow there on the left hand side with when, when the new idea evolves um, and that could be developed by an innovator, a clinician, a scientist um, or might come out of research at a university um, and then it flows into evidence generation. So the data collection to demonstrate that the effectiveness and value of that product or process um, is is actually there. Then the third step that's common is uh, regulatory approval if that's applicable. So Health Canada approval is required on the use of new drugs and biological products as well as medical devices and some types of software. In contrast, new process innovations, changes to staffing or models of care doesn't require this approval. So once we pass that initial three steps, there's often a careful evaluation, for example, a health technology, a rigorous health technology assessment that's done to weigh the costs and benefits of adoption. Certain innovations are quickly adopted. Uh, for example, a hospital might buy uh, new ventilators, um, whereas other innovations might require ministry uh, actions, for example, a new physician fee code. The province may need to also adjust health system policies, programs, or funding models to enable that uptake. So there you have the, the blue circle um, to show that, that direction. Um, healthcare providers can also adapt certain processes and procure new innovations directly. Um, so that policy change isn't always, always required. And then we've got uh, towards the end there, um, real world evidence collection. Um, once there's adoption happening to, to enable optimal use of that technology. Um, so that means the tracking of outcomes to inform the spread of a new innovation and, and spur um, investment in the appropriate areas and, and potentially disinvestment in um, obsolete alternatives. On the next slide, uh, we can talk about some of the barriers. Um, based on this graphic here, uh, you'll notice that it's a it's a complex system that we've got um, for healthcare, um, and there are many different types of barriers. Uh, I've found that it's useful to frame them in three categories of timing, people, and alignment. Timing, for example, a new technology might be too 
simply too early and the, the evidence just isn't there. Um, under people, the value equation uh, can vary depending on which part of the system that's uh, trying to be adjusted or, or that needs to actually do the adoption. Oftentimes, there's there can be a disconnect between innovators, healthcare providers, and peers. So having that um, alignment, which is the next one, um, uh, becomes very meaningful to ensure that the resources are in the right um, right parts of the health system to incentivize uh, adoption. There's also a lens of, we can go back to the next, the previous one. There's also a lens of macro versus micro barriers. Um, a micro, uh, pardon me, macro would be usually structural silos that can lead to fragmentation, misaligned incentives, uh, or uh, just a more of a general risk averse culture. On the micro side, it might be a little bit more manageable in scope, such as limited evidence base, which um, needs further time to, to build that evidence, um, or insufficient in terms of compelling um, uh, value that's, that's demonstrated from a patient outcome point of view. Older adults often see experience complex health challenges and, and multiple comorbid uh, conditions. So um, that piece can actually exacerbate the impact of technology uh, adoption if all of that alignment isn't there. Then we can go to the next slide. Where possible, the province relies on evidence-informed advice to identify and prioritize uh, innovations to show um, the most promise and depending on where it should be invested in. It's important to note that not all innovations require ministerial action, as I mentioned, um, and some, some technologies tend to diffuse pretty organically while others might require regional action. So here we've got four general categories of uh, enablers or levers. Um, one, you've got policy on the left-hand side, uh, funding on the right hand, uh, program design, and standard setting. Each of these can be uh, applied on their own or in combination. Um, oftentimes, what, what uh, the, the sort of key areas that, that might trigger, depending on which types of levers you would use, is uh, the scale and scope. Uh, would it be a tightly controlled uh, implementation in a few sites or a wide diffusion in locations across the province? Does it make sense to do a pilot test or um, does this technology um, uh, have compelling enough evidence to, um, uh, to warrant a permanent change in uh, how a certain system fun functions? Um, so the ministry might move to fund new services to pilot on a temporary basis or inform permanent funding. There might be also conditions on funding. Um, for example, a new service might be limited to particular groups with a specific clinical need, um, uh, while uh, evidence is, continues to be collected, uh, depending on the outcomes that are achieved. And in terms of other types of funding mechanisms, there are volume-based funding, bundled funding. Um, uh, there's also fee, fee codes. So it, the uh, the specific lever really depends on the type of technology, the end user, and the types of incentives that are within built in within the system um, uh, to encourage adoption. And we can go to the next slide. Okay, some key success fa factors that uh, I've been able to identify based on my experience is, is really developing an innovation ecosystem where both public and private stakeholders can work together to, to identify, um, stratify, and, and target particular opportunities within uh, health technology areas. And that ecosystem approach really facilitates that information information sharing of where the evidence status is, what the initial uptake is, what the sort of patient outcomes are, so that we are always grounded by the quadruple aim that you'll notice in the bottom of the slide and grounded in the patient experience. And a couple of examples that I'll, I'll mention as well is um, success factors based on those are, uh, one was the, um, magnetic resonance guidance uh, guided focus ultrasound uh, for essential tremor. This is an Ontario-based uh, homegrown technology and uh, 
it had a focus on very particular slice of the patient population. So low volume, but high cost. And this was uh, supported through a, uh, a provincial program. Um, on the other hand, we've got another example ca called the flash glucose monitor for type one and type two diabetes, where it's a much wider scope. Um, but the way that that technology was implemented was through um, of the Ontario Drug Benefit Program. So for a particular um, a patient population that may not have access to this type of technology. Um, and both of these technologies were recommended. Um, they went through a, a health technology, a rigorous health technology process with um, Health Quality Ontario, the, uh, the pr provincial agency that's now folded under Ontario Health. And um, funding recommendations were made um, by that agency, um, working hand in hand with ministry partners to assess implementation considerations um, and the uh, level of evidence development that those technologies had in place. Um, so with that, uh, I might be close to time, but uh, I'll, I'll say a few more points before before wrapping up. Um, and, uh, and that would be on where we're seeing sort of the evolution of uh, te health technologies uh, from a portfolio point of view. Ever more important is the, the rise of home-based care. So as care goes, becomes, uh, moves out of hospitals and into homes, medical devices and equipment for personal use by patients in non-hospital settings are increasingly playing a role in, in healthcare. Um, so the devices that support this type of trend is um, burgeoning fields like medication as administration equipment, um, home infusion pumps, asthma spacers, uh, things like that, uh, meters and monitors for managing chronic diseases, for example, the blood glucose example that I mentioned, as well as home treatment equipment like wound healing devices um, and other, other technologies in that space. Uh, the benefits of self-monitoring and self-care at home often um, offers key health system benefits. Um, so both at a patient level, a provider level, and a system level by display, displacing the need for health provider visits and associated labor costs so, uh, tied to um, going to a hospital to, to get those types of services, um, preventing complications and keeping patients out of out of hospitals uh, and in the setting that of their preference, which, which, which is primarily at home. Barriers still exist, but we're working towards designing a health system that um, is, is supportive of both technology um, and uh, and and patient outcomes, um, and multiple avenues exist to to submit new technologies um, to the province for consideration. Um, one of those I uh, were listed in an earlier slide. That's the Ontario Together Portal, particularly for uh, COVID-related uh, technologies, and um, uh, for more robust analysis around uh, health technology assessments would be um, the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee's uh, online site where any pretty much anyone, whether you be an industry partner or a researcher can submit applications for their review. With that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you so much, Nova. I do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, uh, should be right up your alley, is um, how does the Government of Canada actually decide which technologies go into their innovative technologies portfolio? Uh, can you give us a few <laughs> thoughts and wisdom on that? Sure, yeah. So I think on the at the federal level, um, there's the Health Canada um, a website where uh, pretty much, you know, vendors can submit their, their applications for review and it's um, likely assessed based on uh, on a matrix and and a prioritization based on need uh, the 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 extent of evidence that's in place and um, and the the value that's that's uh, being offered to the system um, at a provincial level it's a similar framework um, so for example submitting through the Ontario Health Technology Advisory Committee's website um, you would be put in a, a pipeline of technologies for review um, and they work hand in hand with uh, manufacturers to 
um, gather uh, the evidence based on what's collected, whether it be clinical trial data or um, Ontario-based uh, data, and um, they they complete a health a full sum health technology assessment, and that gets uh, funneled to to the the ministry partners for review and consideration. Great, I'm going to. Um... Ask about one of the things you said in your answer there, which was about the value offered. How do you assess the value offered? Uh, is it simply a financial thing or do you look at eventual lifetime costs or savings? How, how does one evaluate the value offered by one of these technologies? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, it's a it's a multifactorial answer, as I'm I'm sure you're probably that's thinking. What I was hoping for actually. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. yeah. Certainly, um, on the economic side, you can you can do a cost effective analysis or a cost utility analysis to to really drill down on the numbers. Um, but then you've also got the societal value uh, side of things. And um, from a system perspective, um, looking at it, you know, from a value based based healthcare uh, point of view. Um, so not not only the the cost reduced, but um, the outcomes improved over over the lifetime of the of the population that we're speaking to. Okay, no, that's that's good to hear actually, and I'm glad it's multifactorial. I was hoping for that answer. Um, how do technology developers submit their technologies for consideration? How do we get into the system? Good question. So a couple of different ways. Um, one way would be if it's a uh, at this point in time uh, in our uh, trajectory, if it's a COVID-19 specific technology, you can uh, anyone can go to the Ontario Together portal uh, and provide a brief proposal of the technology that you're working on, or it could be any kind of idea as well, um, and that will uh, get directed to a, a database and a pipeline for for review and assessment, and um, that could be become a, a deeper assessment and evaluation depending on the stage of the technology. Um, if it's already uh, technology that's already gathered a lot of evidence, uh, and you you would like to submit for a, a full sum health technology assessment, uh, that can be done through the Health Quality Ontario Ontario Health website. Um, and uh, they will reach out to you. Um, they're they're pretty good with vendors um, and manufacturers and researchers and all sorts of uh, partners. Great. Right. I have a feeling you might get a couple of people following up with you on that one. Okay, great. Okay. Um, yeah, got another audience question for you. Can you say more about the innovation model you mentioned, whereby those with lived experience are involved? Uh, the innovation model with respect to um, uh, uh, devices in the community, the the rise of home based care. I think so. That's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. So with that, uh, I mean that that's an emerging trend uh, that I I'm sure my my fellow panelists have also experienced. Um, and uh, there there are multiple different types of innovations even within within that space that could be a particular uh, technology or device uh, or piece of equipment, or it could be a process innovation, you know, as we see um, more and more people uh, wanting to um, age at home and, and um, get care at home. Uh, it might be a, a provider level innovation where um, uh, there's different types of technologies to enable um, uh, caregivers to uh, be supporting uh, their, their family members. Uh, it might also be bringing together wraparound services um, for uh, for a sort of an end to end process on on different types of multi multiple services that a, a aging patient might be um, uh, uh, might be looking to receive, especially with different types of comorbidities. Oftentimes, what we see is a, is a from a from a user perspective, it can feel like a fragmented system. So, a lot of the innovations that we see are um, bringing together, closing that loop, and uh, uh, demonstrating a, a streamlined experience. Awesome! Yeah, great answer. Uh, and I actually think that starts to transition us fairly well into the next section of our program. So, I'd like to invite Neil and Brett to come back online and we'll move into our panel discussion. We've got a lot of exciting questions for all of you. Um, okay, I'm gonna start with one that I hope is gonna be an easy one. I'm gonna ask each of you all to, to provide your answer to this um, and then we'll carry on from that. So this question is addressed to all of you. Um, so from your perspective, what do you see as the most significant barrier to the adoption of technology for aging and health. 
Maybe if somebody can let me know when they're ready to be the first person to answer. I'm happy to do that. Let me talk from a couple of perspectives. One of them is psychology. So one of the biggest barriers, I think, is that as we get older, we learn more slowly. In other words, it takes about yeah. twice as long for me versus my grandson or granddaughter to learn something new unrelated to what we know already. So that's a barrier. I mean, if, it, if someone were to be given a smartphone and told in an hour, I can get you up and running. For an older adult, it would be two hours to be getting up and running. So that's one. But yeah. from an epidemiological perspective, the major barriers seem to be education and income and rural versus urban and minority versus majority. In other words, there are some structural issues in the way in which people in our society have access to um, either adequate instruction or as, as Brett was mentioning earlier, just the finance side of things to be able to um, be able to cross that kind of barrier or those barriers to be able to become effective users. Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, I even know I, I inherited a piano a few months ago and I've been trying to learn piano and it's so hard. <laughs> Good for me, I think. Very good for me. But if you persist, you'll get there. We'll the get there. <laughs> I just had to practice a lot harder. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nova, what would your perspective on this one be? I think from my perspective, uh, this, the structural barriers that Neil uh, alluded to definitely resonate. Um, uh, oftentimes, you're in large organizations you're, and systems, you're working in silos, and there's there's really no way around it. So um, the the lever that we try to use is is collaboration and and information sharing um, and building trust as part of our day to day, rather than on a project by project basis or an initiative by initiative basis. So um, that's that's one big barrier that I see in terms of. Um, operating in silos, um, and and that's the only really way around it. Um, and I think uh, the end user really definitely feels it if it um, if there isn't that cross collaboration in in those types of new technology implementation from an implementation and adoption point of view. Great, thanks, Noah. Um, Brett, what what would you say from your side of things that you see as the biggest barriers to adopting technology and aging and, and health. Yeah, I, I think it's a lot of what I spoke about before, which is you there isn't really a, a one size fits all issue here. It, you know, when you when you look at the, the population as they get beyond the age of 65, you see a, a massive disparity in issues uh, that, that may be causing problems with technology adoption. And, and, you know, I'll just again reiterate that it's typically not age itself. I think that's the big thing that is the one misconception. People think it's just being older that is making them not adopt technology. It's usually many of the same issues that actually cause problems with adoption at younger ages. So if you have a health problem, a finance problem, mobility issues, et cetera, uh, maybe your home is even off the grid. Like these are all the things that we we have to contemplate. And these, I think, we, what we need to do if we're going to fix this problem, as I mentioned before, not to be a broken record, but we need to actually look at root causes and address those root causes. It's not just age. Great. I've got a question here about what do you think we need in terms of new policies or programs to help roll out these technologies more successfully? Anybody have a thought on that? I might aim this to you at, at Nova since you're a bit more on the government side to start us off, but I'd like everybody to contribute some thoughts on this. Sure. Um, from a policy and funding point of view, I think um, a, an emerging sort of area is definitely uh, things like bundled care um, and, for example, um, initiatives like the Ontario Health Teams, where you're actually looking at a an integrated system that's tailored to a particular region and the local needs of that region for that local population and um, uh, addressing the, the regional barriers that might exist that might not be problematic wide. Um, so certainly we're seeing um, some trends towards that. And that speaks to, you know, my my earlier point around the need for integration and um, uh, and how important it is for um, efficient technology adoption. Okay, hey, Neil, Brett, what do you see from your perspective in terms of policies or programs that we would need to facilitate adoption? I can jump in quick. 
Um, I think the most important is instructional support and mm -hmm. technical support. Um, at least from what I've seen with with our projects. If you well, I'll, let me take the ATIS example I gave earlier. When I went and bought my new car, went into the dealership. You know how much instruction I got on the ADAS systems? Zero. Let's look at the instruction booklet that comes with the typical smartphone today. Yeah. Zero. They expect you to go online. And if you haven't been online or you're not good at going on, it just isn't accessible. So that's, I would say instruction is something is, is kind of underweighted uh, because it is so expensive to provide generally if you're in the commercial sector. It, it's very costly to do that. I think with AI systems, we're getting a little closer to automating some types of instruction, but those systems are ridiculously brittle at this point in time. So yeah, no, that's what I would argue for. I mean, we, we saw this in the United States with a huge survey that was done by AARP about, this was the example I think um, Brett may have given about uh, family caregivers or care partners, as we sometimes call mm -hmm. them. Um, they were being asked to do things like um, provide IV support or dialysis support at home with minimal instruction that care partners were incredibly stressed out by having to carry out those types of procedures with what they felt were totally inadequate support. They talked to their physician for a few minutes and they were on their own. And wow. um, so, you know, I think that's a, in, in terms of product design generally, it's not glamorous, but instructional support is absolutely critical. What about you, Brett? Yeah, I'll wait and specifically as it relates to healthcare. I think that, you know, we've had a lot of movement from a policy perspective around the, the funding for healthcare occurring online. So we've introduced billing codes that physicians can bill to see a patient online, and that's been very helpful. Uh, we've eliminated a lot of the financial barriers that have existed for people to access this kind of care when, versus what it was in the previous world where the governments were not funding it. But then the problem that that I think has emerged and what's become more and more obvious is that funding virtual care programs that are actually adopted and used by older populations is not just about paying the physician. The, the program needs to be funded. The infrastructure needs to be funded. You, you know, we have... In Canada and in Ontario, where I live, uh, we have billions and billions and billions of dollars allocated to build physical buildings. Um, but there's almost no dollars that are allocated to build the network and digital infrastructure and to fund the digital virtual care infrastructure that we need to take care of elderly people, either in institutions or at home. And, and you know, our experience, you know, I talked about that program that we had with Trillium Health Partners was a fantastic program, but because it was so out of the norm, to actually get funding to build a program like that, we had to take it almost to the level of the Minister of Health's office to get special authorization to just get a few dollars to fund the, the, the platform. And so that shouldn't be the case. There shouldn't need to be an escalation to ministerial offers to, to offices yeah. to fund basic programs. We should fund digital infrastructure exactly the same way we fund physical infrastructure. Because if you look at the best case examples, you can move 50% of care from the physical world into the digital world, we're gonna save a ton of money on building buildings and that money has to go to digital infrastructure to create something that's usable. Yeah, yeah, you convinced me pretty well there. Um, I've got an audience question and Brett, I think this probably aims directly at you. So I'm gonna keep you talking for a little bit. <laughs> um, is, the question is with technology facilitating virtual sessions with different health professionals, um, how does this impact the continuity of care? Um, and the examples given of seniors who may have cancer or other chronic conditions, and how is that continuity of care maintained? I'm going to say this is a problem even yeah. without virtual care. <laughs> I'll be honest, having yeah, and, had older parents. <laughs> yeah, I'm, well, I'm so glad that you said that because it, it's funny. We get this question all the time, which is a virtual environment. You're going to see a different doctor, and you know how is how is that okay? Given you know the best. Experience is to see the same doctor every single time. And, and my answer is, um, let's talk about what exists in the current healthcare system. So I can tell you as an emergency room doctor, there is no continuity of care or record keeping. So yeah. you show up in my eMERGE, you're, you're elderly, you have a UTI. If you've been to another hospital, I have none of the records. If you saw a walk-in clinic yesterday, I have none of the records. I can't see your family doctor's records. There is zero continuity of care in the physical healthcare system. So 
whatever continuity of care we're building into the virtual care world is a big step up from what's already there. That's that's the first point. And let's not let perfect be the enemy of good is, is the first thing I'd say. But built into many of the virtual care systems are lots of tracking features where you can have a full digital record created after every visit, where you can upload all of your records. And when you see a doctor, if they give you a lab test, you can put that into your profile. You can take pictures of your ECGs and all the other things that you have. So you can have actually a really good ongoing digital record. On our platform, even if you see 20 different providers, um, all of them share records, and it's much better than when you go from the walk-in clinic to the eMERGE. And we also offer the capability for you to continue to see your family doctor or your specialist if they want to be on our platform. You can keep seeing them and have ongoing appointments and then also share those records in an ongoing manner with other providers. So I, I could talk about this for a long time, as you can tell. I, I actually think virtual care is going to be that cool layer that we put on top of the healthcare system that may actually help us to get the continuity in the physical system as well. No, it's not going to hurt continuity. Yeah. Okay. No, I agree with you. It reminds me a few years ago, I did a project with a pharmacist colleague on medication reconciliation. You know, and as an engineer, it took me a while before she convinced me that it was a problem. It's like, <laughs> but it's exactly that. They're getting prescriptions from different providers. They go to the hospital, they get, and they, yeah. So yeah, I agree. It's, it's, a continuing problem and actually I think it should be improved by virtual care and shared records and tracking and being able to see the various changes that different providers have made to to people's care. Okay. We've moved out of faxes so that should be the next step. Slowly <laughs> though. <laughs> I wish faxes would go away but they haven't. <laughs> thinking maybe binders might be next I don't know. <laughs> You've got a few behind you there Nova. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, sh sharing of information and raises a lot of different concerns, particularly here in the States. We've got fairly strong HIPAA regulation. And yeah. so it makes it very difficult. Plus the platforms don't speak to each other. Uh, yeah. Hospital platforms and clinic and individual physicians. I've got at least three health portals I work with from different physicians that I speak to. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, trying to find ways. And it's, and it's an ongoing problem and it's going to be very difficult to resolve until we yeah. uh, start Company. regulating that the private sector systems have to adhere to certain standards yeah. uh, of, is, of interchange. Is that what you, generally the panel feels is that, I mean, this has been, this is not a new problem. The fact that all the systems don't communicate and they have proprietary systems and standards. And, uh, and I think the health data standards that even the ones that came out from what, what I've seen get interpreted in different ways, and they're actually not as compatible as they were intended to be. Um, any ideas on how to solve this problem? Um, Neil's proposed regulation, is that the only way we can go on this? Um, you know, regulation is a very blunt instrument. And yeah. so um, I hate to suggest regulation, um, but my feeling is that, yeah, we wait for the private sector to get their act together. It, it isn't going to happen uh, until we get or allow monopolies to form. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's you're going to have to have guidance from from governments as to how to get those systems to interchange information and provide incentives. They don't have to be sticks; they can be carrots. I mean, that's sort of the reason for the expansion under Obamacare, expansion of uh, some of these systems, uh, forcing basically physicians to move away from binders to electronic systems, but they're ter often they're terribly engineered. You, you probably know this, Catherine, better than anybody. Um, yeah. And so the physicians hate using them, and I won't name names about some of the, the famous providers and the hospital systems here in the U.S., um, but uh, they, they're not good systems. They haven't been well, you know, designed for human users. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we have to work on that end of it as well. So interchange is great, but even getting the information in in a way that people are comfortable and that the physicians and their patients get appropriate access to the records is an interesting problem. And the, you know, the, the diversity in health literacy across professionals versus uh, individuals is huge. And so you can't display information the same way to a patient that you would do a physician. Or to a nurse practitioner. You know, yeah. but, but what do you think on this issue? I mean, I know you showed us the patient side. You obviously also have the physician side. Uh, and how do you deal with the yeah. compatibility issue? What are your thoughts? 
It, it, it's a challenge. You know, we, we've built our whole system to, to facilitate integration. So our, if you know yeah. technology at all, we've built our whole system on API. So our, our system can pretty much integrate with anything and it isn't a big, a, a big difficult exercise for us to integrate systems. Always when we're looking to work with hospitals and we work with a number of hospitals and provincial governments across the country, the, the big barrier for us always is on the other side. Their systems just don't or won't integrate with us. And I, I agree with the point that this needs to be regulated. The, the, the reason why it needs to be regulated is, you know, we, we, we look for uh, people to make the right decision based hopefully on, you know, on economics that it'll be, you know, profitable for them to integrate. But the reality is most of the EHR systems and EMR systems, their bottom line is directly based on making it hard for people to leave them. So hard for providers to leave them, hard for patients to leave them. If they have lots of records and lots of people on them, they, they're very big profitable companies. The minute they share data freely. It becomes very easily for any provider or patient to leave those companies. And, and that's why, you know, we talk about these, these systems being terrible experiences. They're poorly engineered, et cetera. And they can get away with that because it is so damn hard to get off of those systems because you can't get the data out. So um, I actually think it would be good for everybody to regulate something that forces them to have interchangeability and sharing of data, which will force these, these big companies to actually keep their users and their patients by having a good experience not by you know building walls around them that nobody can get over. Yeah, Nova, what are your thoughts on this issue? Um, is this something we can put into the value proposition as the government adopts technology? Can we? It could. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly could. But I would push back a little bit and say, um, if if the end user, you know, physicians and and uh, hospital administrators as as well as patients, if they push back to the to the companies, um, there could be a, a potential for um, you know adjusting the, the the market adjusting to to its customers, right? The because the provincial government isn't always necessarily the buyer for these vendors, these companies, right? So I'd be curious to hear about uh, others' thoughts on on that. Yeah, that's a. I can give you a personal example. Um, so the issue is who is the user of the system, and the user isn't you, the patient, as I found out. So I had a situation where, um, in one particular portal that I used, there was an opportunity to email my physician's office. So I could either email the physician or a nurse. Turns out one of those uh, email accounts was dead, was not working. So uh, unlike most average consumers, I actually got in touch with the company and registered a complaint and said, look, I said, well, no, it's the doctor's office's responsibility to make sure they're up to date with respect to the accounts. <laughs> and the problem is I'm not the client. Right. So they don't listen to me. They listen to the person they sell the system to. So, you know, understanding the user population and, and who has the power and I, I, I agree it'd be ideal if you could just simply say to everybody, yeah, uh, it's your responsibility to have a good system, otherwise you'll lose your clients. But um, particularly in the United States, the client is not the patient. It's the insurance company, and it's not even the physician in some cases. It's the insurance company. Gotcha. So we, have to, we have to pay attention to, you know, who the, uh, honor thy user is the first commandment in human factors. <laughs> um, but understanding who the bills. users are and their <laughs> relative differences in power is uh, is also important in getting usable systems. That's right. Yeah, the decision maker isn't necessarily the the end user, or right. or the the um the people that are implicated by the impacts. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then it gets even worse once you have care partners in the situation in terms of access to records and and so on and so forth. But I don't want to end on a kind of a negative note. I think, yeah, I think I need to are looking at better than they did even five years ago, in my experience. And it's particularly true if you go to the mob to mobile platforms. I've used uh, those health portals, both mobile and on computer, and they're so much better in the in the yeah. mobile versions. Yeah, I think you know Brett's system is a really good example. That I'm kind of waiting for Brett to to stabilize. I do have an audience question exactly on. The billing model for Maple, and so as soon as he comes back, whoever put in that question, I'm going to, I'll ask Brett that. But he's he seems to be the I, one yeah. guy struggling can a little you, bit. Can, yeah. can you hear me now? Oh, okay. can, can you, you hear, hear us, Brett? Yeah, yeah I, I apologize. Yeah. My, I'm having I'm having the death of all internet issues, and this is a good example of of internet problems. So my my Wi-Fi died this morning, and now my cellular 
Design That's not working. <laughs> I've had that happen too, Brett. Sympathies. Yeah, yeah. Brett, uh, if you can hear us. Um, so the question so, I have so you came from our audience is how are consultations on Maple paid? Um, are these billed through OHEP? And I think you did mention getting billing code set up. And what is the cost to the patient? Yeah. So what is the model on getting a tool like Maple to work? So I'm I'm back. So apologies for that. I, I had my my Wi-Fi die this morning, and then I've been uh, using my cell phone for connectivity, and then the cellular network just went out, and so now it's back. So so th this is exactly the kind of mobility challenges that we have to come up and and overcome. Yeah. But the the answer is for for how do we pay for the the visits? There's a variety uh, of ways that the visits are covered depending on where you are in the province and the services that you're looking for. So there are billing codes and we have a number of services that use those billing codes where you can see a, a doctor on the platform and it's fully covered. Um, there are other services that are not covered and many of the other services like allied health providers and things like secure messaging with physicians, et cetera, are not covered. So it, there's a variety of models and, it, and it's also variable across the country depending on where you are. Great, thank you, Brett. Um, kind of following on this theme, uh, how could we incentivize innovation in the space in new new and different ways you thought about that like what would really kind of break down the barriers and change stuff are there some new models we could be thinking of yeah. i mean i think i think my, yeah, yeah my, i mean my initial response just just having gone through this journey starting our company six years ago and building from zero to where we are now it's, it's been a really difficult slog and, and we've faced a lot of barriers i think um, commercialization is the biggest problem uh, in terms of new uh, innovators really getting a toehold here. Um, there, there is really a, a, a huge difficulty for new innovations to, to get access to the early commercialization opportunities. So here in Canada, we have lots of grants that we give to, to innovative companies. You know, we have shred grants and IRAP grants and all these things. And, and grants are great, but grants are almost like crutches that if somebody takes the crutches away, you collapse. You know, what you really need is sort of that that analogy of uh, you know give a give a man a fish and he eats for a day and teach him how to fish and he eats for life like we need to we need to make it easy for these companies to fish and so um, teaching them and assisting them to actually get clients so we need to figure out programs where we can assist um, our corporates to be the early adopters of new innovative technologies we need government rather than just giving grants to actually be some of the early procurers of some of these innovative products because these are the ways that we get the innovators uh, give them an opportunity to get started and show that things work and that's from there where the snowball begins and where they can start to get bigger and bigger opportunities and then this is really where we can start to have successful innovative enterprises that can make differences for huge amounts of people and not just in canada but around the world Great. Thanks, Brett. Nova, what would you add to this, this conversation on incentives for innovation? Yeah, no, those are great points. Uh, I would I would come back to that point around uh, having an ecosystem model uh, within within our province um, so that there is uh, a, a fertile market for these new companies to uh, to tap into uh, and demonstrate um, traction and demonstrate product market fit on the on the government policy side of things. I think a, a new model could be um, that direct linkage between the innovation side um, where uh, there's economic development happening and the um, the sort of user system side of things. Oh, that that might be a health system, that might be education uh, or other sectors sectors, but um, having that clear, clear link, linkage between where the innovation is happening and ensuring validation that there is need for that type of innovation within our particular system. Great. Thanks, Nova. How about you, Neil? What do you think we could be doing better to encourage innovation? Innovation is a really tricky one because what is it? 90% of all companies fail. Um, and so you, you really have to encourage people to be serial entrepreneurs almost mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that you get you get success there. I'll, I'll mention some programs in the states that kind of work but don't work incredibly well. One is the Small Business Innovation Research Grant Project yeah. that's funded by National Institutes mm -hmm. of Health and the STTR as well. I've been involved in a couple of those where you pair up the academic community um, with uh, small businesses. Mm -hmm. And so the okay. two of them can jointly apply uh, for government funding, um, and it's at different levels. So initial level is, you know, looking at feasibility, and then later levels, if you manage to make it to kind of stage three, or you actually get money for marketing your product, as an example. Uh, so those types of programs are, they don't work incredibly well. I was at a National Academies of Sciences workshop um, 
about two years ago, where you know industry was at that table as well, and they were saying these programs are way too slow because they're like traditional academic funded programs, and it takes a long time to get your grant evaluated. Then you have you know, mm -hmm. relatively long, and and the pace of technology development is so quick that these mechanisms just aren't fast enough to kind of support really interesting ideas. You're outmoded before you've actually finished your grant. Um, and, and so, you know, I'm, I'm pointing to it as a possibility, but we, we need to somehow get um, quick access to yeah. both support development and later marketing to really help get innovative ideas uh, quicker to market. Yeah. So really tighter integration, faster speeds, better support. Yeah, the speeds are real tough one, particularly when government is involved. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I could, yeah. I, I'll, I'll take all the hit. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, one other piece I'll add to what Neil said is, is um, you know, the the decision making around disinvestment is oftentimes when it comes to innovation is just as important as um, as investment. So knowing when ideas are are new ideas may not be working as well or as anticipated, and um, taking a portfolio based approach to be able to prioritize the ones that are um, that can really help drive new innovations and and uh, taking taking things to market. Yeah, I like those thoughts. Yeah. OK, I think we are about at the end of our time, so I want to thank all 3 of you for joining us this afternoon. I want to thank you, especially for the conversation, which I think went by far more quickly than I was expecting. <laughs> Uh, and thank you for your insight. To me, this was actually the perfect pairing. I mean, we had kind of the academic, the, the company's perspective and the government perspective. So I thought this was really, really well set up session and that really got different perspectives on the same problem and everybody really working for the same goal, right? Which is what we want to see. Agreed. I, I thought agree. this went really well. Thanks, Catherine, for sharing. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank, thank you. you so much. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.